Welcome to the Harbinger series, where I'll be diving into the potential lore and theories revolving around the unreleased Harbingers. And today, let's talk about the second Harbinger himself, Ildothore. But before I begin with that, I actually want to plug in another extra lore question about him. What does or can he know about the Divine, about the state of the world, or about the mysteries of life prior to the existence of Celestia? So, let's begin. Disclaimer, this is all just a bunch of theories and are not indicative of the final product. Il Dottore, the doctor, or my favorite epithet, Dr. Doctor, the doctor, is the second of the currently known 11 Harbingers. Known as a scientist and researcher managing the laboratories of the Fatui, he was previously recruited by Piero centuries ago and was responsible for several breakthroughs for the Fatui Harbingers. He's analytical and cunning, described by Nahida's character story as the following. His knowledge of the values rooted in this land was without peer, and thus had he intended to take advantage of Nahida's curiosity and sense of responsibility from the very beginning. Indeed, the way he saw it, there could be no bargaining chip more suitable than knowledge. He's also very cruel and apathetic to others when it comes to furthering his research, not really caring who or what he has to go through if it means getting by. His main projects were in inorganic life, his fascination being in the creation of things and equipment to transcend humanity and become on par with the gods. This is why he's fascinated in incorporating massive elements into humanity, or testing the limits of the natural body, or even augmenting humans into something else entirely. He's even done these experiments to himself, and has performed this research and experiment for several decades before finally attaining the techniques that would go on to form the basis of his segments. He also doesn't like being wasteful with his resources and enjoys a classic recycling. Whatever that could mean for someone that deems human life as a resource, of course. As a Harbinger, we first met him in the Genshin webcomic, and he was here for important business regarding Mondstadt. Well, more specifically, Mondstadt's children, as they were being used by his subordinate to experiment on and fight in the Fatui underground arena known as Heresies. It seems that they're being experimented to fight this tentacle monster thing, and dozens of them have already perished because this child was number 139. We also saw in that comic that when the subordinate did die, he was able to take the organic parts of Dr. Krupp and essentially install him into a new robotic body, for better or for worse. He was also confronted by Diluc after the altercation, as the Tori was present to murder Krupp before Diluc could interrogate him for answers. We also hear from Kali that he was the one who experimented on her when she was a child. She was surrendered to the seer by her family as a call for help considering that as a kid, she was suffering from Elazar. And unfortunately, that seer Barnabas turned out to be working for the Fatui and surrendered Kale over to the Tore for experimentation. We further know that the Fatui have researched on Elazar and its causes, symptoms, and outcomes for a pretty long period of time. Some people believe that the Elazar hospital notes were actually the Tore's notes on the matter, since it's strong vocabulary and slight deviation from what should be a medical practice. If you've never read the Elazar hospital notes for yourself during that Archon quest, I really suggest that you do. It's a really fascinating read if you're into experimentation and human altercations, and it's easily one of the darkest pieces of Genshin lore just because of how graphic it is. But nevertheless, the notes are about the patient, Abbas, and how his body began altering because of the Elazar. It goes into a very deep dive into the body's problems and the various treatments by a doctor. The diagnostic report states the notes of a doctor whose name is redacted, but I speculate that this is the Torah's notes, just by how it was written and the overall antagonistic theme of it. Instead of calling Abbas as a patient like how he was originally filed as, this doctor used the word specimen and hosts several trials and operations on his body. Here's several excerpts. Following the new method, the material rejection rate has been significantly reduced. Specimens 2 and 3 developed mental instability due to associative connections to fundamental inner qualities of and tended to attribute the disease to unverifiable divine punishment, consequently considering it blasphemy to accept as treatment. It is a very interesting thought, though. Exploring neural stimulation and the resulting cognitive shifts could be a future research topic. Due to the above uncontrollable variables, they halted at stage 2. A shame. It is possible to use to control the elemental content of a person's body without relying on elemental power. There is potential for weaponization. Discussions of research on have to be increased in the future. Humans have unlimited potential. It may be foolish of me as a researcher to write this, but with enough input, I might be able to reach the level of a god, or so people might call it. This account fares well with his whole ideology that humanity can surpass godliness with the right innovations, something we'll get to later in his backstory. 
But it is still a theory if these notes are his, and it's never really confirmed otherwise who the hell wrote this. In game, we meet him through his Omega build, and how old he is is really unknown. He has several breakthroughs in his research that have passed for centuries, and one of his segments depicted Tore as a senior citizen if we just listen to the voice. The Tatarasuna incident, an accident that happened around 300 to 400 years ago, was also caused by him not only for the actual downfall, but also for the quote unquote innovative research from Fontaine and the integration of Chris Romero into their work. This increased forging efficacy and production. He was also the one who invited Scaramouche to be the key reference material in his experiments. He also used to have a facility in Liyue that catered to ruin guards, something that actually matches very well with his backstory. He was cast out of his hometown with pitchforks and clubs, called a madman and a monster by the academia. His backstory stems from the series of notes called Zandik's Legacy. The name Zandik is an illegal name that can't be given to the wanderer, and is the name of a Sumerian scholar that was ostracized and shunned by the academia as a heretic. As such, Many, myself very much included, find it really hard to believe if the Tore isn't Zandik just based on all the correlations. If this doesn't turn out to be Zandik, I will eat my hand. So let's investigate the lore. Zandik's final ranking in the academia is unknown, and was smart enough to be called a trainee Dastur. Zandik's darshan was never mentioned in the notes except that he is not a Morta, though a part of me likes to think that he's from the Kasharuar since they specialize in studying technology and structures. That's just a guess though. Zandik and his colleagues at the time found the Shwanen Ritter, and he believed that it was made of exquisite mechanical parts that have a unique and ingenious style. His entire research revolved around the mechanical aspects of the Shwanen Ritter, and he was quite attracted by the ancient machines left behind by Conria. Zandik was also known to act without authorization, to the point that his third offense was recorded as having resulted in the critical injury of an Amorta Dastor named Sore, an offense that could easily have been an attempted murder considering he and Sore were having a picnic. They say she got wounded by tigers, but the dissection records on her body was a fatal injury to the wound and a potential case of mechanical asphyxia. Another offense of his is that there was also an instance of the ruin machines turning on and almost killing the entirety of his party, had it not been for Zandik's intervention. He insisted though that it be brought back to the academia for disassembly and reverse engineering, to which he was reprimanded. He went into immense research into the ruin machines in the forest, and definitely incorporated a lot of those machines into future developments that include did Skyrimush's robot and other mechanical things in life. It's also very much possible that his factory in Liyue was made in the future to try and replicate the old glory of the Shwanen Ritter, but he was just never able to duplicate that kind of technology. And again, if Zandik doesn't turn out to be El Dottore and his name being unavailable to wander was just a red herring, I will eat my right hand. El Dottore's Commedia counterpart is very reminiscent of himself on the surface but actually isn't. Both Zandik and Eldotore are erudites, but the social commentary of Eldotore as a character is meant to represent those people in society that speak about so many things, but are actually talking nonsense. They're just talking for the sake of appearing smart, but are actually ostracized for being a know-it-all. On the other hand, Zandik is unimposing, so much so that an insightful person like Tignari couldn't even directly call him malicious, just utterly uncompassionate. On a lighter note, Ildotar and Pantalon in the Commedia are comedic foils and are usually pitted against each other. Nice to see that carries over to Genshin with both of them being corporate partners. Dottore is beyond powerful, and his power set is nothing to scoff at. He was introduced in the manga as a champion who defeated Urza the Drake, and basically used that achievement to hold Mondstadt over the hands of the Fatui as a glooming power difference and indebtedness. He also has his prostheses, well, had them. To be fair, he did destroy all of them allegedly as an agreement with Lesser Lord Kusanali, but the fact is that while he destroyed the current prostheses he had, it isn't like he can't just make new ones since he definitely has the resources and the knowledge to create them in the first place. He is also referred to by Nahida as something that's transcended her strength, and with all his academic achievements, I can definitely agree with that notion. Dutara is a human that achieved not only longevity, but also perfect simulacra. Well, as perfect as they can be when your personality is horrendous and you start fighting with even yourself, he's also able to mechanically augment others and himself and has centuries worth of knowledge about both ancient and modern technology, capable of unlocking A's direct seal on Scaramouche and configuring the Akasha to brainwash the Sumerian citizens. His technology alone is such a versatile arsenal that trying to fight him would be a battle of who has more resources than the other. His unit as a second harbinger is also nothing to scoff at, as his prestige alone is intimidating enough. 
When he gave the God of Wisdom knowledge that even she didn't know, you know that the Torah is something else. Asking what the Torah knows about the Divine is a difficult topic to theorize about, but given his existence for hundreds of years and both his disregard for the limitations of human knowledge, it's not impossible to think that he has knowledge about the time before Celestia and the truth of the world. The Torah's knowledge about the stars being a lie would have led him to future research into the origins of the gods, definitely bleeding that curiosity into the primordial one. But considering that the Fatui have immense knowledge on the Descenders and the origin of the Traveler, I don't doubt the Torah also has a solid idea about the Bishops and that there was a whole civilization that existed prior to the rise of the Seven Archons. There has to be a reason that they're targeting the Gnosis now after years of potential action. The Torah also has immense knowledge on artificial life, making me believe that he's already diving into the art of Chemia and the Abyssal Power Integration. Remember, Scaramouche, prior his assignment of being the sixth, was sent into Abyss for several tests, and the Torah himself has had extensive research into the integration of organic and inorganic life. I don't doubt that the art of Kenya is something that he tried to go through as a part of a research. But that's it for me today. The Torah is a fascinating character with a lot of moral dilemmas that don't just boil down to a sympathetic villain or somewhat. He's actually very easy to hate, and I hope that Genshin utilizes that part of his character because Genshin doesn't actually have a lot of evil characters. All the more reason that the Torah stands out. He is the outlier in a sea of sympathy, generally just lacking compassion if it means having the results he needs. He has been an erudite through and through ever since he was young, and is willing to kill for the sake of his research. It's just a very refreshing character, honestly, and I hope we see more of him in the future. Anyway, my name is Aster, and before I leave, I actually want to plug my Discord server. It's a side server that I'm not really planning on mega managing, but it's literally just for me to ping people when I have game nights or D&D &D things. Anyway, that's it. Link down below. But my name is Aster, thank you for chilling with me.